Ooh. Hello. So thank you for joining. Um, it's an immense honor to be here with you today, uh, something that I would never expect to happen. But this is the hack, the crash, and two smoking barrels, and how I almost killed an engineer. And I must mention that uh, basically I had no lawyers advising me before my talk, so I will not, if, if you will not be able to reach me after the talk, it was nice meeting you. And now why you are here, because some people in the industry really pissed me off, and I wanted to be the one taking the stage. And now that I got probably your attention, let's start. I'm Thomas, and yeah, my pictures are usually so bad that uh, making it black and white didn't really help. It's like my accent, it can only go worse. And people also know me as Crow Tom. And the main thing you need to know about me is that I lead an amazing team uh, in Auxilium Pentest Labs. They are uh, competing in the car hacking village right now in their second. Um, and I also love to hack like everything, day, night, whatever. Mainly to prove to me and you that our world is hanging in, on, in really thin threads and that most products are created with two main components, a bit of laziness and a sprinkle of capitalism. And for more, you can always go to my website. What we will really, really talk about today is vehicle security, or how I like to call it, all the stupid things that automotive industry is doing still in 2024. We will try to understand where we are, uh, where we are heading, and if there, are any, if there is any light in the end of the tunnel, hoping to get more people interested in the industry I love and highlight the significance of all the safety-related hardware that no one cares about. What we will definitely not talk about is extreme exploit chains. I love to hack, but I'm the worst at it. And this means that I'm not here to teach you how to do it, but to show you why you should be here too, and why you should care. Also, if you were alerted into coming to my talk because of the title, I'm sorry to tell you that during the process of the testing, preparation and development of my talk, no engineers were actually killed or suffocated due to lack of oxygen. And let's start with the state of the industry. And what a better start than one of my favorite examples of my living room on wheels. Uh, as this car is not actually a result of Pin by Ride episode, but still packs more functionality and entertainment than my living room. This example of a computer on wheels might be one of the extreme ones, but it's becoming kind of the norm, to be honest. Vehicles are getting connected, getting richer services and functionality, something that the users ask for, I guess. What they don't ask for, though, is for these services to be implemented in an insecure way. We see examples of improper and insecure implementation of new functionality every day, and with a handful of examples making the news every week. And while news outlets are mainly interested in the financial aspect of the thing, um, no one wants like their car to be stolen, to be honest. I will mostly focus today on the safety aspect of those security issues. And while the industry waits for the security software-defined vehicle Messiah, today we will start with the complicated architectures that look like this. Uh, here we have a representative example of a vehicle architecture with the individual parts being electronic control units, different embedded components that most of the time have a single specific purpose inside the vehicle. All these are segmented in several isolated buses to avoid external communication or interruption and segment them by functionality and criticality. What you can also see is the fact that some of the interfaces are getting exposed internally, though. And as we saw previously, this is a kind of a necessity considering new technology and requirements needed to exist to make it, make it happen. As an example, the onboard charging ECU has an exposed interface handling the communication between the charger and the vehicle. And the main head unit that the user inter uh, interacts with is exposed to the internet through a telematics unit. Most of the times for SOS calls, OTA updates, and more interconnected functionality. Now, of course, the purpose of this talk is not to cover everything automotive related, but we need to get a bit of understanding on what we are seeing here and what the demos are representing later. Uh, for this reason, we will mainly focus on CAN, uh, which many of you might know as it exists for more than 40 years. Um, and you would be surprised if I tell you that the majority of the ECUs we are testing still come with this interface. And of course, the need of a single ABS ECU 30 plus years ago does not even come close to modern needs. So the, the protocol has several iterations, but still the main issue from my point of view is that there is no encryption as a standard and no message authentication. 
This makes CAN messages flowing on those buses prone to interception, injection, and replication in cases that no additional protections are implemented, which is more common than you think even 40 years after its inception. Of course, this is not only uh, the only technology which is currently used in modern vehicles, but it's one of the most commonly used. And that's why it's important to stress its flaws, considering the stubbornness of automotive companies to stick with archaic and insecure technologies. As we speak for the current state of automotive security, it's worth mentioning that um, st what started to be enforced to all manufacturers homologating vehicles uh, in UNES and member countries. Um, but I don't want to bore with you, as USA does not have as any specific binding regulation similar to this, but it's worth mentioning that it's a starting point for shaping the completely unregulated mess that exists still now, now in, in our industry, but of course it's still a regulation with all the negatives that come with it. Considering that I will have a relatively negative talk, I want to state from now that while the majority of the industry has a negative approach to cybersecurity, there are several people that still strive for secure and safe vehicles every day with their work, research and discussions. Though not everything in sunshine and flowers, and automotive is mainly based on 100 plus year old mechanical engineering industries that were recently forced to implement a lot of things they had no idea about and innovate in an environment with really short life cycles and restricting safety requirements that will make most of us cry in, any case, in many cases. I struggled a lot though, so let me tell you my story. To start with, I have to tell you that I'm tired of, tired, tired of hearing about the state of automotive security by professionals in commercial events, referring to a couple of good examples in the sea of OEMs and tier one suppliers developing products in this industry. Tesla and BMW are not the only companies out there. And yes, while I really appreciate their work, in some cases, we are here to talk about the industry as a whole and not the two examples that are out of the ordinary. And I'm saying this because Vulnerability disclosure programs are not the norm here. The small amount of OEMs that escaped from their mechanical engineer, engineering past attitude or they started in this new generation of automotive manufacturers is not representative for the whole industry. And even the companies that incentivize and support researchers, they only give payouts to findings that are heavily security critical, but no mention to safety critical issues and exploit chains. And I'm saying this because the last two years I discovered 25 safety-related findings, out of which only two were accepted till now. And not because they are out of scope or not applicable, but because there is no way to actually disclose them. To start, to start talking about them though, uh, we need to get an understanding of one of the protocols we approach today in our example POCs, namely the Unified Diagnostics Protocol which lives in the application layer of the ECUs and allows diagnostic functionality such as reading and erasing faults, reprogramming, testing and monitoring. It commonly consists of several services that handle specific actions and the common one here that we will try to use in, uh, in these examples, in these demos, is the ECU reset or service 11, which is commonly used to perform a reset on the ECU, as the name implies, but of different types. So depending on the supplied subservice, we can specify if it's a hard, a soft, or any other supported uh, type of reset on the ECU. And finally, I have to mention that the hard ECU reset is most, in most cases, it's equivalent to a, com to a complete power cycle, and we will see how this can go really bad for the ECU. Now, the last five years, me and my team performed almost 200 penetration testing and research projects in the automotive industry. Uh, is the screen? Yeah. In the automotive industry, sorry. And this means that, first of all, we got a broad understanding and experience of how security is implemented and discovered several nasty things along the way. While we try to work with all these people to make the products more secure, the issue is that I'm not able to talk about those, so I had to find a way to share some of those juicy things. So it was during a warm summer in Arizona when I had a rental unit from a brand which I tried my best to hide here. And during my free time and during night, as if I was testing during the day in Arizona, I would not be here, uh, I started working, uh, like poking around uh, this thing that you see there, and I had my first hit. In this case, we triggered something that is not 100% clear what it is from the context given in the error created on the heads-up display. 
For this reason, we need to dig deeper and understand the architecture of the vehicle, understand how, why, in which extent something is affected. Is this error real? Is it expected behavior? Does it even have any security or safety impact or not? This is the only, is, this is only a part of the questions that I have to answer at this point in order to move forward. And that's what I did. In the first demo, you see how we discovered that the affected ECU, uh, and by issuing a simple ECU reset on the user accessible onboard diagnostics port, the ECU resets and the light of the affected blind spot, blind spot detection sensor is engaged. Of course, I didn't stop there. And because at this point, a lot of educated guesses can be done considering uh, what was discovered. As is, the finding has no big safety-related severity outside of the fact that it can distract the driver. By listing the known facts, though, we can assume where the affected ECU is located in the architecture and how this can be escalated further by a malicious user. What we know is that, first of all, we can power cycle the ECU. And, what, and that there are no preconditions that can restrict this action, like a vehicle speed uh, restriction, for example. Additionally, from the function of the assistive driving, uh, we can assume that the blind spot detection sensor is connected with the functionality of the aid assist itself. By this, we can easily prove that the sensor can be triggered mid-drive. Uh, as a direct result, it can confuse the driver because of the engagement of a sensor in an unexpected situation. But more importantly, we can engage serious, serious safety implications to the ADA system, like steering interruption during a lane change, or even braking engagement during a false safety-related incident on the blind spot detection sensor. Of course, I don't want to check these assumptions myself, um, and I hope I don't need to mention that um, you, you should always check safety-related issues in a safe environment. Who has the ability and the environment? The manufacturer, of course. And for this reason, I had to find a way to report the finding and prove those assumptions. Now, going through the process of vulnerability disclosure, I initiated uh, by trying to find a communication channel uh, with the OEM and a couple of years ago that this happened. The problem is that there was no vulnerability disclosure program. No one was answering to me regarding this from the contact options and the people I discovered online. But of course, I didn't give up. I kept hacking. And getting our hands a bit dirtier here, we need to introduce the main access control mechanism in UDS diagnostics called security access, which, as you understand from my diagram, is a simple challenge response. The client requests a random seed, the ECU generates what seed, uh, that seed and calculates the key using the secret algorithm and secret key. And after that, the client needs to know the same secrets, use the random seed and calculated key to send to the ECU, where the ECU verifies, uh, verifies this uh, calculated key and grants or rejects access to the client. The implementation high, highly depends on the cybersecurity requirements of the OEM most of the times. Uh, and when these are loosely developed, we see some unimaginably sloppy implementations, backdoors, and weak sources of randomness um, or any other random aspect of uh, the process. Where this access control is used no, uh, commonly, I would say mostly software updates and reprogramming. And the most commonly used uh, and high severity instances uh, is these ones. Um, mainly also the ones that we care about and that shows the level of access they can give us in cases of compromise. And of course, it's automost automotive, so the process is not encrypted. But it's behind an ADPS. And it's a challenge response, right? Knowing that the process is unencrypted, we already know that we can intercept and replay a seed and the applicable calculated key for the process. Message authentication also does not exist in 99% of the times here, so that should not be an issue, most probably. But even with access to the bus, managing to intercept the seed and the applicable key should not yield to elevated access, as the process heavily based on the random aspect of the seed. Um, if we cannot control the seed, we cannot replay a successful seed key pair to obtain elevated access to the target DCU. Or can we? 
And going back to our friend ECU Reset, I want to remind you that one of the subservices capable of full power cycling the ECU is the hard ECU Reset. This is the direct outcome though, indirectly by completing a power cycle, we also perform a reset to the system clock in many cases. And here we see the effects of this assumption. Uh, while the seed of the target ECU can be considered really secure at 32 bytes, we can see that we can reset the system clock with an ECU reset, and after a predefined and fixed delay between the reset and the seed request, the supplied random seed is always the same, with a staggering 100% accuracy. In this case, we invalidated the assumption of what is needed in a challenge response when we can intercept successfully a seed and key pair. With that in mind, we only need one seed key pair to obtain elevated access to the unit, which can potentially be obtained at a service visit or during an OTA update from the head unit. Fast forward two years later, and I eventually discovered someone that was willing to help me report those issues to the OEM. I prepared a well-structured report of, of my vulnerabilities and sent it to the contact point working for the OEM. The issues were acknowledged a couple of days later, but, but privately. At this point, we know that these findings were not only affecting the model and model year I tested, but several models and, and of the brand and numerous model years. So we are talking about a significant number of affected vehicles. The drama start, starts here, though. Despite the help from the contact point, OEM decided that the cost of fixing the issue exceeds the expectations for this model. Um, the excuse is that the future electrical and electronic architecture that they designed will mitigate those issues in the models for 2025 and 2026, which of course directly means that the currently sold architecture is still vulnerable and that the OEM is not willing to either fix or disclose the findings publicly. As a romantic myself, I decided to not publish the findings. I wanted to act professionally, especially in comparison to the norm in my industry. And irresponsibility brings chaos. I'm not the one feeding this beast. Trying to find a solution, I decided to, re uh, to propose a responsible disclosure to a generic VDP, namely the ASRG, Automotive Security Research Group, which out of many things, they are also an officially recognized CNA. So after a short discussion with my contact point in the OEM, uh, I decided to report the issue to ASRG, something that needs to be mentioned out here, here for the sake of complete, com, uh, completeness, sorry, uh, is that I disclosed the finding in a generic email from the website of the VDP, and not to anyone directly, just the generic available email address that was uh, on the website. At this point, and after a couple of email exchanges with me, the OEM and the ASRG, the OEM stops responding completely. I was completely clueless of what there is to follow. Uh, despite my continuous effort to resolve the issue and find why this happened, um, the OEM wasn't responding to all uh, of our requests, or to any of our requests. And not only they didn't give me a reason, but I was directly accused by third parties, which I never contacted or revealed my findings to, that I'm collaborating with hostile nations. You don't accuse me of doing something like this, especially when I tried so much to responsibly disclose this shit, and, not, and the only thing they did was find excuses. And to be honest, I don't want to dox, dox anyone. Uh, this is not why I'm here. I'm here to share my experience and maybe shake the industry a bit out of this limbo they are into. But what happened is that the, that the person that handled my case in the public VDP had the citizenship of a supposed hostile nation, which the legal department of the OEM decided that it's not good for their image. You want to hear some plot twist? Uh, basically, this guy does not live in this nation. He has another residency on the homeland of the OEM. And guess what I recently learned? That he has chosen to handle this topic because of an affiliation with the OEM. And he, has, he was the best person for this job. But the OEM research can go that far, of course, or they didn't even care, to be honest. After all the drama, and after I contact all the parties, saying that this level of accusations from third parties, and the fact that they disclosed, they disclosed the private findings outside of the legal framework was unacceptable, I also announced to them that the findings will be published at the day of DEFCON today. 
And of course, this is the day they answered. <laughs> Something that needs to be mentioned here is that during the initial discussion for the findings, I was clearly asked if the finding is discovered by directly connecting to the ECU or from the OBD port. Um, as the OBD port is user accessible and the findings are applicable, and if it's only applicable to the direct connection, we'll mark the findings as mitigated by the IDPS system. Something that I don't agree, but it was reasonable. This though, not so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, today I'm releasing these two vulnerabilities. As I said, I don't want to dox anyone. I want a safe future with cars that can support their functionality in a secure way, but in in this case, the OEM, instead of communicated, communicating, decided to play politics. And it's not only them, this is the common trend. Researchers are not the ones to blame here with falsified accusations. As in most cases, we are more than happy to collaborate and help each other. And not only researchers, pen testers too. Let's crash it and see where it brings us in this case. As we saw previously, politics play a big role. Not only in public disclosure, but in private projects too. Throughout my time with automotive security projects, I heard a lot of excuses by engineers and management only uh, on why they don't want to accept or fix an issue. The usual suspects are loosely developed requirements, uh, or internal or external, strict deadlines, and long product life cycles, along others, of course. By my uh, but my conclusion is always that it's a culture issue. Either the company culture or the respective local culture affects the way companies consume, approach, and mitigate issues. Of course, it's a complex issue where regulators, governments, and external parties are co contributing to the development and production of a full vehicle. But in the end, the people I interacted and work worked with uh, out of these projects construct my perception of this industry. But considering the culture and how the findings are approached, what do we need to do to persuade them about the severity? Which level should we reach and why people, uh, and which people should we contact? Who is responsible for the person that will die if my next finding is not fixed? Even if you develop the target with security in mind uh, and with the best of intentions, logical flaws can exist and exploit it. Developers of different components usually only interact with a vehicle simulation, ignoring how one action can have a security or safety event outside the scope of the functional testing. And this is how safety-related findings can be discovered in most unexpected for the manufacturer behavior. A completely unrelated issue of seemingly minimal secu uh, security impact can have a devastating safety outcome. As a first use case, we can easily get the example of electric vehicles, where I was testing the security not only of a battery management system on the onboard charging, but the batteries themselves. By analyzing the communication and while I was close to the car, I discovered that there is a sound generated when I was injecting uh, an unauthenticated message. When I started discussing with one of the engineers, it ended up being the battery contra contractors of the AV. I was immediately concerned at that point, knowing that wear and tear of the con contact uh, surface can increase the resistance and lead to excessive, excessive heating. And you know what, what comes with after excessive heating and localized, uh, especially heating for extended periods of time? It's of course fire. Um, of course, I cannot burn an engineer and I cannot conduct a test to prove physics, the physics behind, behind it without risking the battery pack burning non-stop for days. So the topic ended there, the vehicle is out, all engineers are safe, a couple of hundreds of thousands of users are not. Same applies to hydrogen and the loving OEM that could not understand why small leaks in, hydrogen, in the hydrogen tank can affect uh, the specific rotations of the valve and can lead to suffocation of the whole garage we were working in in a couple of minutes. As I said in the start, uh, I have no magical exploit chains, but to prove this finding in an effective way doesn't take much. Considering that at the current state, we can easily spoof messages in an unencrypted way and perform a power cycle with an unrestricted service, we can easily find a way to reproduce the issue from an exposed interface. Because most of the times, manufacturers try to use the obscurity factor as a way of mitigation for those findings. But as we saw in the architecture, modern vehicles are getting more 
connected than ever. So find the exposure interface, directly communicate uh, with the ECU, uh, and start sending. That's my advice. Even if it needs some cutting around. Now, of course, after that, you have to listen to all the excuses about how your exploit is not realistic and how physical security mitigates issues in digital security. When at this point, it's time to put them inside the vehicle and show them a juicy can injections where they will either believe you or they will believe in God. Of course, for safety reasons, and when I'm ready to unleash my magical exploit chain, there is always some party pooper that restricts me from doing so. And thank you to this party pooper, but uh, I guess in many times it's not only that they don't believe you, uh, but they even want to prove you wrong during the night because that's who we are. Next day, I found this in the garage after some engineer tried to engage the injection from the OBD port from, for the sake of completeness. This is how I left it the previous day. Continuing with the trend of naiveness, though, both from mine and the engineer side, I got my hands on an ECU unrelated to commercial projects, and I thought, here we are, let's do some exploitation. So I started my common workflow, tried to exploit, trying to exploit UDS and trying to evaluate the source of randomness. But after several hours, it didn't seem feasible, so I had to resort, resort in other solutions. So I tear this thing apart and started getting a better understanding of its guts. I analyzed the hardware parts one by one and started getting deeper inside my rabbit hole to realize that it's one more case of automotive SOC architecture with all the pros and cons that come with it. The biggest thing that has to be said about it um, and which will help us understand some of the issues later on is the fact that ECUs are considered safety-related components with, uh, which require real-time responsiveness due to the safety-related nature on the products that utilize them. So by opening one of the targets, we can easily see what happens here. Not only one SOC, but two exist on the target board. And this is because of the safety-related functionality we mentioned earlier. An, in an instruction needs to be executed twice in either two different controllers. Um, in this case, the secure and application controller, which we discovered, or two different isolated cores, and then compared between the two. If the output of the instruction is the same, it gets executed. If not, a fallback, a fallback procedure has to be followed depending on the system. Of course, this architecture is applicable to higher severity safety related devices like airplanes with more secure controllers needed, but this is out of the scope, at least for today. Why this is important? Uh, because in the devices in which it is applicable, their fa failure will result in loss or damage of equipment, environmental harm, injury, or even death of some users or the surrounding people. And moving closer to the hardware, we see that not only the supplier was kind enough to spoil the fun and let us uh, tell us when uh, one of, where one of the JTAG headers is on the board, but they included the second header for the secure controller. Unfortunately, there, uh, after connected, connecting my debugger, I discovered that both the JTAG interfaces are locked. And after I desperately started clicking on my power supply, I realized something really interesting. And here you can see... Uh, did it start? Yes, so here you can see that the device is locked by normally connecting my uh, JTAG debugger to the, to the unit, to the target ECU. And by connecting the JTAG on the first seconds after boot, you can see a nice easter egg that we get debug on the secure controller. So yes, we got access to the secure controller. In this case, we basically got to enable the debug access in a really short period of time during boot. Uh, and as a result, we can control the execution and dump the memory of the vulnerable controller. I love automotive security. I know that you are not yet tired of the fails. So on the same ECU, and because we are talking about the telematics unit, there is a Qualcomm modem SOC running, which comes with these magical pins that, if sorted, provide us with a nice Qualcomm download mode. And after discovering some other pins seemingly matching a USB port pin out, and performing the dangerous act of connecting a random USB 
from an ECU purchased from eBay, we realize that our assumptions are correct. After I dumped the firmware with more than one way, as you see, I realized that the automotive-related controller has several references to the system clock, which confused me even more, as my process of discovering weak sources of randomness till now was unbeatable. So what is happening here? Went back to my terminal and performed some more tests. And as you see here, uh, when the seed capture goes faster, we can make some really important observations which is that the middle byte of the seed is incrementing by one. My assumption, assumptions seemed more correct than ever, but I was also more confused than ever. Uh, there was some missing piece that I was struggling to find, some implemented mitigation that was in front of me but could not see it, what this mitigation was. Of course, security through obscurity, as always with automotive. And I started thinking, what if the ECU is restricting software power cycles for safety reasons? As we are talking about a telematics unit that has to be always available for SOS calls. And if that's the case, how can we control a power cycle in more, than, uh, more ways than an ECU reset? And that's where my favorite re relay comes into play. And we immediately see not only a duplicate, but a complete compromise of the unit here. POC for this will be published under my tool Karen Caribou Next, uh, but it's nothing that you cannot easily make in a couple of minutes. The main reason that this happens is because there is always a battery in those telematic systems to mitigate downtime and unexpected power cycle that will restrict the unit from performing an SOS uh, call during an emergency. So we got a bit pranked for a second there, but found a way through eventually. And for the smarties out there, that uh, this is not only applicable to controlled uh, environments with power supplies, but many EVs nowadays come uh, with external on, or inter internal for passenger vehicles battery isolators, mainly used in safety-related incidents to cut power and mitigate the risk of fires and other issues, uh, but I used, to, I used it to bypass restrictions that were only possible on individual ECUs. And now by controlling the power supply externally through the battery isolator, we can perform all these attacks in a combined manner in full vehicles. Here we see the exposed battery isolator uh, of heavy duty vehicles. And here we see something I discovered a couple of weeks ago, the battery isolator of a passenger vehicle, which of course made me laugh, but uh, it will make me cry probably in the future when I will get into more politics with the manufacturers about the applicability of my future findings. This is a sample list of the applicable findings for this ECU. And of course I had no response, so I guess nothing to see here. But it's not only dark and stormy days. While everything we said now is applicable to most of the OEMs, while this is only a small, uh, this is only a small subject, sub subset of the issues we see every day, and they clearly are some relics of vulnerabilities discovered in modern vehicles and components. And while several CVEs are currently stuck, you saw because of uh, the unacceptable attitude of the industry, there is always someone that breaks the norm and makes us smile, and not because they made everything perfect, but because they proved a point. So one small manufacturer came to us for some common service. We started evaluating the unit. And after several, for several tries, we didn't manage to discover a single entry point to the custom ECU. While the hardware used was one of the cheapest of the self hardware a developer can buy. And what was the solution in this case? one of the cheapest of the self hardware a developer can buy. And we're talking about this mighty ESP32, a low cost, low power SOC that was fitting perfectly the needs of the OEM in this case. Of course, it's not built for safety critical functionality and its main focus is automation, but for the case we needed, for, for the case needed, there was nothing more needed by the OEM in this case. And from a security standpoint, it proved a big point. Because this $10 ESP32, in contrary to what comes with hundreds of thousands of dollars of automotive, uh, worth of automotive SOCs, comes standard with an RNG. It uses a combination of thermal noise sourced from the hardware analog to digital converter and combines it with the asynchronous clock mismatch for true random generation, as we call it in this industry. And I say it again, with $10 
but does it solve completely the problem here? Of course not. There are still ways to bypass these mitigations, but the point is how difficult and financially viable you make it for an attacker to perform an attack like this. It's not about how sophisticated an exploit is in the end, it's about who has the biggest, biggest budget to invest. So the mitigation is clearly about how expensive you make it for an attacker to break into your system, steal your IP, or even potentially perform coordinated attacks. And while looking at systems like the PlayStation running non-safety critical chips that implement state-of-the-art mitigations for these issues, and our computer on wheels cannot even mitigate the basics, I'm left to wonder, is there any light in the end of the tunnel? And my answer is that it's up to us, all of us here, to make the best out of it, the best out of our work and our research, to pass out our culture to the people that we're working with, from the higher to the lower level, not with bitching, not with attitude, but with scientific proof, with our POCs, with our posts and our talks. Let's make the world a safer place, one POC at a time. And in honor to this year's theme, remember, to take back the internet, we need to engage. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Hi, awesome talk, thank you. Um, did you think about going to NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, who is responsible for implementing safety standards for car manufacturers? Yeah, look, th there are several things that we can do. I agree with you. The problem is that you have to take several steps into reaching a point that I will follow your advice, you know. I mean, the specific advice you gave right now. It's like, I agree with you, but I would expect that the manufacturer already handled it. Of course, in, in many of the cases, maybe I did it. I, I cannot reveal it to you, but maybe I did it. But I, I have to say that there is a need for something to change in this industry, and that's what I had to clarify here. I uh, to totally agree, and it, that would be the perfect world, wouldn't it, if you know, people, and I think most engineers, want to do the right thing. They want to operate securely and write good code and, and all the rest of it. But then, to your point, there's that sprinkle of capitalism and um, budgetary this and that, and somebody says, well, it's good enough. And yep. then, you know, that's, I, that's why we do sometimes need those government agencies, even though they themselves are not the most efficient, right? Um, so I agree, there definitely. needs to be a balance, but I think there needs to be a balance um, in, in all the ways, you know, even for who talks where, you know, there are the commercial conferences that everyone brags about from the industry. We also need to talk about stuff. We also need to be able to get the stand and start discussing about these things. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you. Hi, uh, again, thank you for the talk. Amazing talk. But um, do you think emerging, tech, emerging technologies such as automotive ethernet or secure CAN transceivers might help mitigate some of the risk? Definitely, definitely, and we see a change on the industry. As I said, software-defined vehicles and centralized architecture is something that we, we hear about a lot of years now, but it's not yet implemented in many vehicles, and that's why I was talking about the differences between uh, mainstream OEMs and the new type of OEMs that are basically IT companies that started building cars. Yeah. So this is the main difference. They have way more experience in this, but the industry need to, needs to catch up. They are exposing so many things and they need to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, for, thank you for your talk, this was great. My question is regarding your toolkit. Is everything, you know, hand-built uh, Python? Can you a bit Yeah, my question is about your toolkit. Is everything Python scripts that you build or is there a software or platform uh, that we um, can No, basically it's a modular tool and this is not only the POC, that you, but you can use it to perform the same attacks to other vehicles. You, so, what's the name of that tool? Uh, Karin Karibu Next. Uh, it's a fork of the original Karin Karibu, which is a state of the industry for a lot of years, but I just make the fork because of uh, the slowness of the development of this project. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.